God is a redemptive God and he is writing his story of redemption for you. I'm Angela Madden and I'm joined with Pastor J. Anthony Gilbert. We have a powerful program today about redemption. We do. I'm real excited because we have a former gang member who is now the president of a nationally known ministry. He's here to share not only his ministry, but also his unscripted journey of where Christ has brought him from. So we're going to go over here to our set and we welcome to the set. Uh, I'm so excited to have him, Emil Zwayne, also known as EZ. Good to have you, brother. Hey, Jay and Angela. What a blessing to be with you guys. And, you know, it's always an honor to be able to connect with believers because even though we don't know each other personally, I feel like just even before we came on the program that I've known you guys for a lifetime. So thanks for having me on today. Amen. We're so glad to have you. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm observing the books behind you, but I understand <laughs> this was not always the case. You were a gang member, like for real, for real. Yeah. Can you yeah, share no. your story with us? Well, a gang wait, member uh, now with books. Let me, let me say something real quickly though. I mean, cause when we first came up here, I'm looking like, I'm looking for this guy that's all hooded out and you know, raising up the signs, all that. He came out, got bookshelves behind him. You, you yeah, definitely have gone yo, from yo, Crypt to Christ. Up? Yo, 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 yeah. you know? <laughs> you definitely have gone now from Crypt can... to Christ. Yeah, God, God has done a work. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite things, like I was telling you guys earlier is, when people look at me and say, I just can't imagine, there's no way that was you. And it's a testimony to what scripture tells us. If any man is in Christ, he's a Amen. new creation. The old things that passed away, behold, all things have become new. So yeah, you know, I was born in Lebanon back in uh, 1975, immigrated to the U.S. with my family in 1980. And Lebanon was a real war-torn country. So just at the outset here, when I came, I had this sort of like uh, soldier chip on my shoulder as a kid. Got in a lot of trouble in school and, and just was, but basically I was the poster boy for the sinful nature. If there was any doubt, kids are born with a sinful nature. I was, I was living proof of that. And so I just got in a lot of trouble when I was about eight growing up in the Catholic church. I did what was called my first Holy communion and decided from there, you know, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to be a good kid. And I did, but what I did was I cleansed the outside of the cup, like Jesus talked about, but I hadn't been born again. My heart hadn't been transformed. And so after a while, peer pressure set in. My long list of do's and don'ts of living the moral, you know, clean life just was a distant memory. And got into high school, and that's when things really spiraled out of control. I was my freshman class president, but got kicked out at the end of my freshman year. Got sent to another high school my sophomore year. And believe it or not, I was a, I was a rap artist back in that time. You guys might remember Montel Jordan, that famous yes. song, This Is How We Do It. This is how yeah, we my, do my it. Yeah, <laughs> right, you remember that. Yeah. So my producer my producer had written that song. And then you guys remember Coolio, Gangster Paradise. Yes. Uh, my, my producer wow. had written most of the songs on that album. So I was 15 years old. They took me on. Wow. And, uh, man, I was headed for the big time. But I got to that new high school connected with some guys that love, you know, rap and we became friends and little did I know they were, they were gangsters. They were Crips. And one day we're walking off campus. They said, man, we want you to be a part of our set. So they jumped me in, which is the initiation, you know, for gangs. They beat wait, me. Wait, yeah. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Explain what jump out. me in is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so they did that. What and that uh, mean? next I'm thing sorry. I know, the dust Easy. settles. I want to stop you for a yeah. second. What does that mean to people that are listening? Because a lot of people don't know what jump me in means. Explain to us what okay, that means. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, so that means basically you get beaten to a pulp for a, a minute or two. You know, they actually use a timer, believe it or not. Gangsters getting sophisticated, you know. Wow. And they just, they pummeled me, man. And uh, wow. And that's how you get in, you know. And so I remember the dust settles and I'm just sitting there. And it was just just surreal, right? You don't, you don't plan that in your life. I'm going to be become a crip and so there i was man and from from there things just really spiraled out of control and uh i just i started to get further and further into into darkness and depravity and then a good friend of mine invited me to an evangelistic crusade um august 15th 1991 and just a month before i turned 16 and i went with them and man i'm telling you i thought for sure this preacher's had some hidden cameras in, in my room following me around he had a chip in my brain he was reading my thoughts so i'm like what he was hitting everything i'd been thinking about and then he gave the gospel and and it blew my mind that he said salvation is a free gift you can't earn it you can't work for it i was in trouble with god i'd violated his law there's nothing i could do to clean myself up but if i repented and placed my faith in christ he'd set me free and that night uh you know, Jay and Angela, the Lord just revolutionized me. Everything about me changed. The way I walked, thought, acted, felt, 
I was a new creation. And uh, from there, I ended up, you know, graduating high school, going to, to a Christian university, biblical studies and theology major, uh, became a part of a Bible study that blew up to 200 people. We became a church. I co-planted the church. And uh, then one day got connected with a crazy man named Ray Comfort. And uh, everything changed from there. And so that's kind of my story in a nutshell. I, I summed it up in a verse years ago. I once was but a lump of coal upon a heap of mire, yet Jesus Christ redeemed my soul and saved me from the fire. There's that rapper man in me coming out right now. <laughs> yeah, you can take the man out of rap, but the rap stays in the man, right? <laughs> so That's let me right. ask you, just kind of even backing up, you were five years old when you immigrated here, and you said you had a little bit of that kind of soldier chip on your shoulder. Was it, did, right. you, did you feel like you were like kind of an angry kid who was always set out to prove himself? Or where, because yeah. then you, I mean, quickly in ninth grade, you were kicked out for what you know tell us that yeah <laughs> no man that. angela you know what that's a very insightful question i've very really rarely been asked that but yeah you nailed it i had this this deep anger that was brewing up in me you know you you come from that background and then you move to a new country you're learning a new language you're you're trying to get in and and get accepted and your parents are 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 you know pushing you in this direction so yeah there was a lot of that in me i was a really angry kid in fact you know my bedroom wall was filled with with posters of rap artists and groups it was just it wasn't just because I loved those artists and groups but because I had holes all over my walls and and closet doors and so I had a lot of rage and anger in me and just amazing how the Lord melted that when when he opened my eyes and saved me wow, wow. Well, you know give us a little more insight because uh you know you said you were getting ready to have major you know record produced um you're connecting with all these types of people I mean it's it, most of the time when you hear a story like yours it's usually hey I got shot I was almost crippled I got ran over yeah. uh, I escaped death gave my life to Jesus you were on an uphill swing what was right. that encounter like that it made you leave like because I mean if you got a, a record label ready to sign you and all of that I mean that's a big jump away so Tell us a little bit more about what happened in that time that caused you just to leave all of that behind. Yeah, no, really good point there. I mean, in fact, I, I had people say to me in that time, are you nuts? I remember my DJ, my producer, they're like, you know, I mean, back then it wasn't like today everyone's mixing music at home and stuff. Like, it was a big deal to, to be in the studio and to have producers yeah, and huge. to have your artist contract, uh, you know, artist producer contract signed. So, yeah, so, uh, but but, you know, it's like Paul said, you know, I count all these things as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And so what my soul truly needed was forgiveness, redemption, the, the, the weight of guilt that I bore. Because, you know, growing up, like I said, when I did my first Holy Communion in the Catholic Church, I was, I was hearing the Ten Commandments and, and realizing my, my, my kind of inability to measure up. And then being in the lifestyle I was in, I was entrenched in that. So there was a lot of that guilt and that that sense of, man, I need to be made right with God. And so when I heard that God was willing to, to forgive me, because that was my thing, you know, growing up in, in my context, I thought my good had to outweigh my bad. I had to work my way to heaven. And I knew I wasn't good enough. But when I heard that Christ did it all, that he bore my sins on that cross, he would give me his righteousness as a free gift. Man, it was like water to a man lost in a desert that hadn't had a drop of it in, in, in days. And it was like, oh, Lord, save me. And that was it. Now, Easy, like you were a part of the Crips. Like blood and Crips yeah. ran right. California. You know, LA. people don't realize this. This isn't like just a little gang yeah. that, you know, of a couple boys in a school. And it's not easy to exit that life. Yeah. So wow. did, yeah. were you able to easily get out of that? Or, or, That's why or how did easy. you? Right, right. <laughs> how did that <laughs> well, that, that, was for a, you? that was a part of the story of grace, you know, in that when you get in, you get jumped in. Like I was saying that initiation. But to get out, now you have to get jumped out. But now they're not on good terms with you anymore because, you know, you're, you're right. leaving the gang and they're not happy with that. So it could get brutal. But I remember I called my homies. I said, look, I know I got to get out how I got in. That's fine. Whatever. They said, well, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll get back to you. And later they got back to me and they're like, you know what? We don't want to have anything to do with that God stuff. It's like they got a little superstitious. We don't want to mess, mess with God's boy. You know, we're going to get struck by lightning. So they let me out without even jumping me out. And later I was sharing my, the gospel on my uh, continuation high school campus and uh, the, the girls came up to me. These girls came up and they said, you're talking to some guy about Jesus. And they said, he got really mad. He was talking about how he was going to beat you down. But your old homie took care of him. 
So it's like now they're supposed to be my enemies, but they were they were defending me. And so God just graciously worked that out. So many wow. other circumstances that are mind blowing in terms of what he did. Well, that could be a song. The wow. night I took a beat down for Jesus or escaped a beat down for Jesus. I mean, <laughs> hey, you you're know, giving me ideas, brother. I, you know, I'm trying to throw it out there, man. We can work together somehow, man. We can make yeah. it happen. My, but Jay, my new producer. I like yeah, he can sing too. <laughs> hey, quick question. You know, look at everything that's going on with P. Diddy and things that are happening in his world, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. I remember Mace, I remember I was listening to Mace when he first came out and he left out because of his faith. And now you wow. see him in a whole different trajectory than where Diddy is now. Are you, have you seen the same thing with the friends you walked with? Like the people that you were with now, did they take a turn for the worse while your life was saved for the better? Oh, big time, man. I mean, you know, you know stories of them ending up in prison, getting shot. Uh, their lives destroyed. And that's why, man, I stand back. But for the grace of God, there go I. And I just yeah, say, Lord, yeah. thank you for your mercy. So, wow. well, yeah, you see, it's, we, it's been a it's it's been mind blowing. Yeah, it has. And, you know, we've so enjoyed this interview with you. And we want to hear a little bit more about uh, your ministry. And listen, we've got more coming up with him in just a moment. But right now we're going to see what's going on with Anna in this segment of Trending Now. Revivals are happening all across America on college campuses and beyond. Check this out. Thousands of students gathered at the University of Arkansas recently to seek Jesus and hear the gospel message. Unite US reports that 10,000 students from 67 different universities gathered for this event, making it the fourth major collegiate revival in less than a month. Meanwhile, at Shorter University, a private Baptist university in Georgia, Nearly 50 of the school's football players made decisions for Christ and 17 took part in a water baptism on the football field. Now that's a touchdown to cheer for. We also reported earlier that 1,500 students showed up at Texas A&M University to hear the gospel. 62 were baptized. And in Ohio, a few Buckeye football players made a bold stand for Jesus during a student-led event on Ohio State University's campus. Hundreds attended and approximately 60 gave their life to Jesus and were baptized that night. Man, we are watching God pour his spirit out on our sons and daughters, just as he said he would. Let's continue to pray for our young people and stand with them in faith. I'm Anna Schmidt and this is Trending Now. That gives me chills hearing what the Lord is doing on university campuses around this nation. God is surely up to something beautiful. We're back here with EZ. You have been phenomenal to talk to. We love talking with those who have powerful stories like this, EZ. So from a gang member, now you are doing something quite different with a very recognizable ministry. Share with us your role and how kind of your gang um, life maybe led you to what you're passionate about now. Yeah, you know, Jesus said, he who is forgiven much loves much. And after the Lord just touched me and opened my eyes, man, I was just so hopeless, helpless, counted out. I just had a passion to serve him. And so, like I said, I immediately went to a Christian university and began to pursue ministry. And, and then I, I became a pastor at 20. And then, like I said, one day I, I encountered a man named Ray Comfort. I think you're, uh, much of your audience would be familiar with him, I'm sure. And Ray also happens to be my father-in-law. But what a lot of people don't realize is Ray's of Jewish descent, and I am of Arab descent, like I said, from Lebanon. Wow. And so together, we are proof that through <laughs> Jesus, there can be peace between Jews and That's Arabs. Right. And, uh, you know, and if not that, we're just going to start a new mattress company called Easy Comfort <laughs> and call it a day. You know? That's amazing. So, yeah, but it's it's been it's been such a joy serving the Lord and seeing what so what He's done in my life uh, and the the opportunity we have. You know, our our ministry by God's grace is, has been reaching the world now for a while. We have a television program that airs in almost every country around the world. A YouTube channel that has a million and a half subscribers, almost three hundred million views. Uh, one of the top podcasts right now in the world. Uh, called uh, Living Waters Podcast. And and then I, as you guys know, I just wrote a book, which just uh, blows my mind that, that the Lord allowed me to do that, you know? 
It's awesome because I think about how your story really of joining a gang was probably a lot of it to kind of prove your manhood, to show who you were, that you were capable of these things. And whether it's life right. imitating art or art imitating life, you're now spending a lot of your time showing men how to show up as a true man. Do you find right. in that journey of, of, of what you've gone through and now what you're helping other men to do, men to do what is the most rewarding part of it and what is it you're really trying to nail home to our men? Yeah, well, my new book is called Fight Like a Man, A Bold Biblical Battle Plan for Personal Purity. You know, we're living in a day and age where people can't even define what a man or a woman is. We saw that with a Supreme right. Court justice nominee, which is right. just like, how did we get here? You know, and so, of course, men have lost an understanding of man what manhood means. And when sometimes when people hear that title, Fight Like a Man, they immediately go to, well, you know, man is, is masculine and he's athletic and he's physically strong and he's, you know, he could be all those things, of course. But 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 really, when I speak of fighting like a man, I'm talking about courage and commitment and conviction and integrity and devotion. Men are willing to to fight for for causes that are beyond themselves and to lay their lives down for others. And so this book, you know, is the, the subtitle is A Bold Biblical Battle Plan for Personal Purity. It's a book about sexual purity for men. And so I've been blown away, Angela, to answer your question by, by the fruit from this book already of men saying, man, I was ensnared in this for years and, and I'm free. Like my life has been transformed. And so it's been a delight to see that, to see God touch and change others. And again, a lot of men don't think there's hope, but there is. And that's what the book is really based on. You know, you talk about in the 90s, uh, easy where obviously, you know, pornography back in the day was, you know, you had a Playboy or something like that or whatever magazine. Men had it under their mattress or someplace hidden, you know, and right. uh, now we're in a generation where it's on our phones, it's on our iPads. I mean, billboards. I have to cover sometimes right. my boy's eyes literally from the billboards that are out there. You know, when you think about Fight Like yeah. a Man, you know, you came out of the gang life where, you know, you're you, all the the more women you have, the more of a king you were, you know? So right. now we're in this generation where we're battling all of these things. How do we stay pure? Because we're inundated with all those things. What is the process? Yeah. What do you tell men and how, how do you do this? Right. Well, it's interesting, Jay, because, you know, you would think that with all this accessibility, men would recognize that, man, we're, we're in a massive war, but that's not the case. We've become desensitized. And so men have a peacetime mentality when they need a wartime mentality. I mean, can you wow. imagine yeah. a soldier yeah. being deluded into thinking that he is on a luxury cruise ship heading for the shores of Bora Bora to an exotic resort, yeah. when in reality, he's on a Higgins boat heading for the shores of World War II Normandy? I mean, this dude's going to be sauntering off the Higgins boat clad in a bathrobe, some fluffy slippers, and a remote in his hand, and he's going to get smoked. Yeah. And so men need this wartime mentality. Man, we, we need to fight. We need to stand up and say, no, I have to battle. And so, so th there needs to be that realization and we need to understand our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. What are their tactics and what is our counter attack? And that's what I do in the book. I deal with that. And, 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 you know, a lot of men have this, this mindset of they, they just can't, you know, they, they can't help it, but they can. If Elon Musk put up a hundred million dollars for any man that went six months without looking at pornography once, <laughs> you know, a lot of men would do whatever it takes to do it. Wait, but we have the spirit of the living God. I, Elon Musk put up $100 million? Us. I don't remember that. I'm saying I mean, if. Oh, if. if. <laughs> oh, if. I thought you did. I was like, really? Okay. I was like, oh, my You're goodness. Like, Wait, where do I get that? I was like, I'll I had a <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm saying if Elon Musk did that, right? I'm saying yeah. that if men had that incentive, they would do it. But, man, what about fighting for our families, for our children, our, our, our wives, our, the testimony of the gospel? You know, wow. any man who – if a guy came at your wife and he, he pulled back his fist and was about to clock her – or had a, a, a you know a, a gun aimed at your kids and was going to pull the trigger, you would jump in front of them and absorb that blow or that that bullet. And yet we won't fight for our wife and children when it comes to being men who walk in purity. So I break it down. I give those practicals. I have this last section called the six C's to succeed. And I give biblical principles and, and alliterated points men can memorize, meditate on, along with scripture, internalize, so that they have what I call preventative preparedness. And they're ready for the battle ahead of time. They don't just find themselves in the midst of it, like that analogy I gave, but they're ready to battle and fight. So what is the number one thing you think that men can do? I mean, I understand this battle. Um, I have a lot of safeguards and things I put in my world. I teach other men different safeguards. But in your opinion, 
what is the greatest safeguard a man can use uh, in order to stay pure when we're inundated with sexual sin? Yeah, the number one, the number one weapon is a genuine, intimate relationship with Christ, mm. a, a, a living, vibrant walk. And a lot of people, you know, we're looking everywhere to, to try to find a solution and it's right under our nose and we don't even realize it. We want something more intricate and sophisticated. And I give all these principles, but the, but the prime thing is a living, vibrant, close relationship with the Lord where you walk in the fear of God. You understand the Lord is with you everywhere and you're motivated by love. You, you envision the cross and what he did for you and how he gave his, his life. And you don't want to dishonor a savior like that. And then, you know, you incorporate accountability, openness, and most importantly, repentance, you know, and some men, they think they're beyond it. They can't fall. Those that haven't, especially Christian leaders, and we see how many have fallen, but you know, the, the strongest man in the Bible fell, the wisest man in the Bible fell, the godliest man in the Bible fell. So if men think they can't fall, like Vodi Bakum talks about, they're saying they're stronger than Samson, they're wiser than Solomon, and they're godlier than King David. And that's stupid. Come on. I love that illustration. And, you know, I think about when you were saying that, you know, the man on the cruise line versus preparing for war. Joe Lewis right. is attributed, the bo great boxer, was attributed with saying, a reporter asked him, you know, what is the punch that you're most afraid of? He said, I'm not afraid of any punch I see. It's the one I don't see coming. You know, and so exactly. I, I love that you're taking the time to really prepare men for that mindset of being warriors, being these men who are out here protecting their personal purity. Absolutely. That then it, it tr trickles down to all of us. That's powerful, yeah. easy. And I've been, you know, I've been blown away by the response. It was the number one new release in its category on Amazon, the number one bestseller in its category on Amazon when it was released. Uh, you know, John MacArthur endorsed it, uh, wow. Kirk Cameron. Um, you know, Ray Comfort and many others. So it's been a joy to see what God's doing. Well, Easy, we so appreciate you. Thank you for your, your uh, uh, story and what God has done in your life and your ministry and all that you're doing to help mm -hmm. men to stay uh, sexually pure and uh, come back to Unscripted Faith anytime. Thank you. Check it out. Fight Like a Man, Bold Biblical Battle Plan for Personal Period. Yes. You can get it on Amazon. Thank you guys for having me. Amen. Amen. Well, when we come back, we're going to share our thoughts on what is the line in this day and hour between being sexy and classy in the body of Christ. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. A place of rest, a beacon of truth, your source of encouragement and entertainment. Welcome home. had a time here on Unscripted Faith, and I hope that you've been enjoying it. And we just had a great interview with Easy. It was outstanding. And, you know, we're talking about sexual purity, Angela. And, you know, nowadays I see a lot of first ladies uh, that are trying to be sexy and things along that line. And, you know, you have daughters, you're married. I mean, I have a wife. Yes. I mean, I want her to look good. Yes. But in your opinion, for a lot of people that may be watching, listening as well, What's the difference? I mean, where's the line drawn of modesty? Where can you, as your, your husband, consider yourself, okay, I look good to him, yeah. I look uh, classy, versus being trashy, sexy, yeah. or something along that line in a way that's not, that's not biblical? You know, I think it's a great conversation because in today's hour, it's very difficult as a woman to go into a store and find something that is modest length, that is modest fit, yeah, you know? Yeah. And you know, the, the old saying, modest is hottest, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but like, I think that the, the measuring tool is just like Easy said, you're measuring against Christ. So if what I have on, if I wouldn't feel comfortable, if the Holy King is in the room mm. and I'm sitting down wow, with yeah, him, I'm feeling uncomfortable with him, 
then I probably shouldn't wear it. You yeah. know, I think, and that's the measure I use with my girls because again, it is so different in today's, I mean, you look at homecoming, what, some of these, I, I mean, their tank tops, honey, pulled down. Oh, you know man. what I mean? So it's like, it's, oh, yeah. and it's so yeah. hard yeah. because they want, you want to be trendy and, but it's trying to find that line that I would be so happy for my Jesus to see me because he does. Yeah. And also, I feel real cool in this, you know? Yeah, yeah. What about you, Jay? Well, you know, I think uh, our, I have two boys. Yeah. So my thing yes. is now teaching them how to stay pure. That, you know, one of the things that we've done, we've opened up our lines of communication with them. I've realized something. My boys are going to see uh, women. They're going to yes. have desires. Of course. You know, they're going to have sexual desires. Of course. There's nothing wrong with the desire. It's what we do with it. So one of the things I do is I make sure that they know, hey, you're going to be curious. Yeah. But I've already started educating our boys on how they need to, like, if they start having those desires, they're yes. going to want to see ladies. Yep. They're going to want, their friends may even present it to them. Yep. But that doesn't mean they need to indulge. I said, this is something you preserve for your wife. But this is what I tell them. If you start having an issue, yeah. if you see something, yeah. you have questions, come talk with dad. Yes. Come talk yes. with dad. Let's talk about it. I'm not going to fault you. I'm not going to shame you. Yes. Because women need to dress modestly, but men need to understand there's a proper place and a time for where you can exercise those feelings and that's desires, right. which is in the confines of marriage. So that's kind of where we've kind of left it so far. Our like boys that. are 10 and 9. Yeah. Uh, so we're coming into those years. Yes. But I think nowadays, you know, like, I love uh, my wife, baby. Big shout out to you. I mean, she can dress. I mean, she yes. got the nails, she got the hair, yes. she got everything, uh, but she's always classy. Yes. Always classy. Yes. That, and I would look at it like this, and you correct me if I'm wrong. If, if, you, if the imagination of a guy goes some places with what you're wearing, yep. then you need to make an adjustment. Yep. They can look at you and say, okay, you're attractive, right. but the imagination be, oh, I now leave nothing to the imagination right, of, about right. what I got. Well, right. I think it's that part, leaving, you know, like you said, there should be something that they don't see, they don't know, Correct. right? Um, I, I think also with girls, one of the big things is, is that it's natural to want the attention, right? Scripture tells us right, our right, right. now desire, it's an improper, uh, an improper desire for man to want us, for our desire to be for our husband. And so for the girls, it's more this question of, listen, don't wear anything hoping for their attention, but look to protect your brother to the best of your ability. Now, mm -hmm. if a man's got an issue with your toe, honey, that's right. his that's issue. His, yeah, if he's, he's got, got a you know, problem. Right, that's yeah, exactly right. 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 So, so we, we as, as women, I think it is always this balance, just like with the men, it's this balance of just making sure, as it is with all things, that Christ is at the center of my perspective for it. Yeah. And if he alone says, hey, that looks good, that's all right, you can do that, then it's okay. Yeah. I'm not doing this for him, I'm not doing this for her. You know, it is all about being centered in him alone, Jay. You know, and I also think the flip side of that, like how I'm talking to my boys, I'm sure you and your yes. husband talking to your girls about oh, what time. proper attention yes. looks like because that's a man right. should pursue a woman. That's right. That's exactly right. We mm. want the proper attention. That's right. The, the guy who's applauding your brilliance and, and your strength and all of those things. And it doesn't, it's cheap. It's yeah. a cheap attention to be giving up something out here when it should be about what's inside of here. Amen, amen. So ladies and gentlemen, it's important that we learn how to live sexually pure in this day and an hour. And listen, you've heard it all here on Unscripted Faith. You can walk in purity and God will be your help to walk out his journey with you. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.